I have to explain a little bit what's what's all that about um, about generative design and typography, what we are doing this um, week. And at first I have to talk a little bit about generative design, what I understand or what's the, the main thing about it. Um, maybe if if you know the, the, the word generative design uh, or maybe processing or P5, you people think very quickly at visual output like, like this, uh, lots of colors, lines, um, circles, ellipses and stuff like that and think, okay, visual stuff like this is generative design. But in fact, generative design is not a special kind of style. Of course, some, some styles are easier to produce with generative design, but, um, but it's not style. Generative design is more about the process, how to, how to come to an image, for example. Um, and so we have to have a look at uh, what is the difference between the, the other ways of uh, or other processes and the process of generative design. And the, um, the usual or the well-known process is that we, as a designer, in fact, can you see my mouse if I'm doing something here? Yes, yes we ah, do. Okay, great. So just for me to know, because I... <laughs> um, so we, as a designer, if we have an idea, um, if, and if we're drawing or using Illustrator or um, maybe Photoshop or something, um, or InDesign, it's all always some kind of manual execution, how we come to that output, what we want to achieve. And the main thing about generative design is replacing this manual execution with these two blocks. To simplify it, um, and so it's not manual execution uh, execution anymore. It's um, having an idea and then trying to abstract that idea into some rules or, more technically, an algorithm, um, and then translating this algorithm to source code course, programming something that the computer understands, and then the machine is executing the source code and producing the output. And something more, something more about that process is that, of course, that output might not be um, exactly what, um, what we wanted to have, we still have to evaluate if the output is what we want to achieve. And if not, we have to maybe change the rules or maybe just some lines of or numbers inside that source code, which at most points is um, maybe just some numbers or stuff. So that was very abstract. So I want to uh, give you a, an idea um, of how is that working with a real life example, not really coding example, because uh, baking some cakes, for example, is uh, very similar to generated design. Because if we want to um, bake some kind of cake, I don't know if you all know marble cake, but uh, yeah, uh, doesn't matter. If you want to bake some kind of cake, um, you can't just um, take all the ingredients and put it together with your hands. You have to have a recipe or recipe, I think is the, is the word, recipe. Um, or maybe for... Uh, Simone, was it just for me to know? You you said you're uh, uh, American, Swiss Swiss American. Yes. Can you tell me what's what's the uh, right pronunciation? 
A recipe. A recipe, okay, so good, thank you. <laughs> um, so you, you need a, a, a recipe which you can just follow um, and you need some ingredients which I call, uh, call the source code. I, th I think the metaphor right now here is is lacking a bit, but um, so and if you have these um, all this, you just follow the the rules and you get some kind of output. And now, if this output is not exactly what you want it to uh, to be, for example. Uh, the recipe didn't uh, tell you that you have to stir, stir the um, the stuff all there, uh, or if it's not sweet enough, you just can't add some more sugar later on. Of course, you can it on the top, but but not in here. Um, you have to change either the algorithm. Oh, okay, mix all that stuff, or change the parameters, which might be, okay, it's a little bit more sugar for the next try. And then you execute that recipe again, and then you get an optimized output. So, of course, that was an example which is not with coding, with programming. Um, so, another example with uh, a programmed structure, for example, if we have an idea like this kind of bubble structure, which is lots of lots of circles, okay, of course you could uh, do something like this also in Illustrator, but it would take some time to, to put all that there. And if you want to change something, you have to do it all over again. So maybe generative design or programming would be a good idea, but then we have to Think of an, a rule and an algorithm, what we want to the computer to do. And of course, we have to think a little bit hmm, how to how to start. OK, maybe we can start and take one circle and position that circle randomly somewhere and then increase the circle size until it touches another one. Of course, for the first circle, this might be a problem, but yeah, that detail uh, can to manage uh, try to manage it later um, and then we have to put all that into source code and that's another kind of problem because there are lots of lots of programming languages uh, or frameworks and um, what I've written here is just a very 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 short um, amount of, of other um, programming languages, but some of them are better for what we want to do and some are not so good and some are easier to understand and so on. So what we do this week is to we pick just one, P5.js or um, yeah, P5.js and uh, do it with that. And of course, we have to think of where we do it. Of course, we can take a code editor or uh, maybe that's what we at least start to do. We're going to the online editor and trying out stuff here and typing stuff and then, okay, um, getting an example uh, or a result. And then of course, say, saying this, we have to somehow make the source code for our bubbles example, which would look something like this. And what we get is this result. Okay, some somehow cool, but not perfect. What's, what's wrong with that? Any suggestions? <laughs> Mm 
no one <laughs> we haven't done anything to prevent them from generating inside another one yeah right so there are lots of circles inside the other one so okay right now if we're at that point and maybe we could export this to illustrator we could remove all of the other circles but in fact that would be quite quite um exhausting because there are also in all little circles or in many of them are little circles and so on so better we change our rules so we have to prevent circles from being inside ours yeah just as you said um and if, of course we have to change the source code and do this and then it would look like this and we i maybe that's great and if we're at that point and maybe we can say yeah that's perfect but now at this point with generative design the good thing is um, that if the code is there at one point it's very very easy to to just make little or a bit bigger uh, changes to improve that and make stuff so we could think of uh, we could um, program a little bit more to animate all that uh, which could look like this for example the mouse is producing the circles at different positions and there is also some kind of bursting bubbles and so on so it's kind of easy to just um, continue with that and and make it more complicated or to change other parameters for example just like the color so little circles have other colors than big circles right now and it's very very easy to to make lots of lots of variations for example with that color but that's some also something that you can see um, not all variations are equally interesting or good or um, yeah, nice to look at. So it's still us designers to, um, to judge if something is good or not. Or another way of changing some parameters would uh, maybe to replace that circle with other shapes. With that, you also can have lots of lots of other examples, some more realistic or very mm, strange abstract. Um, and again, it's us uh, to decide which is good, which is not so interesting, or which fits our needs. So that was one little um, um glimpse of what generative design is so generative design is um really really not more than just replacing manual execution with let's say programming algorithm and programming um so it's just a some kind of special technique like for example photography because Photography is some, also something that uh, can do things which you wouldn't be able to, to do uh, manually or with Illustrator, for example. So using this new process on one special realm, like, um, for example, type, typography, because that's what we're doing right now, I uh, just want to give you a bit broader um image of how we could apply it to typography we just we just do one thing in that uh, course but um and what we will do is more or less something like this uh which is the the general or the the most yeah, the, maybe the easiest way to to uh, manipulate manipulate typography is taking a uh, normal letter which some somebody already designed or maybe you design and then just distort it um like this could be an 
Helvetica A, and uh, this was transformed to points and lines and all that stuff. And we could maybe put some points on the screen and distort it with the mouse or connect this with lines. Still looks a bit different. And so on and so on. So what we look right now is manipulate existing type and do something with it. Could be really, really nice and interesting and probably um, many of you will do exactly this throughout this week. So um, these are other examples. What could happen? So moving the outline randomly a bit or having more than one outline which will just produce different stuff or maybe that would be a bit too complicated which is a simulating growth of uh, like bacteria or stuff um, which will produce something like this. In fact, it's a bit complicated to program, but it's not so complicated how it looks. So maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you see changing parameters will give some, um, some more visual variations. Or here's another example of which which I found somewhere. Um, it's not from from my workshop in the former years, but uh, somehow similar from from the approach. Uh, it's also having normal letters and then having some kind of circles moving through these letters and uh, producing interesting effects. And it's also very nice example of how changing parameters leads to very different or yeah, very or slightly different results. But um, as you can see, just having the circles less or more or bigger distances or not growing these just leads to interesting different results. If we have that, that point that we can manipulate existing letters, uh, we could ask, is it possible to program or to make a, a code, make a program which generates letters from, from scratch, just that the computer knows nothing from, uh, from the designer and just generates letters. In fact, there is, that's not really, possible right now, I found one approach from, from the early 1990s, which is already 30 years ago, um, where a scientists group around Douglas Hofstadter um, tried to program a system which could, could um, which you could give some letters, for example, these A, B, C, D, E, F, and the algorithm should try to um, continue the alphabet. So making a G which looks similar to those and so on, which is somehow more or less easy for us designers probably, but for a computer to, or to tell a computer how to do that is, is really, really difficult. And in fact, um, although um, machine learning and um, artificial intelligence and so on is, is quite good right already right now, but this kind of stuff is not, not so easy to do still. So this could be could have been some results, but in fact these were not uh, 
as far as I know, made by computer, by the computer, but still by humans. So they didn't come to an end with that project. But what we could do is somewhere in between is also an approach um, how to manipulate uh, letters is not taking an uh, existing letter, but making a, some kind of skeleton and then drawing letters around that skeleton. An example. So that's some project I did some years ago and tried, uh, okay, what if I have designed, these are letters that I've just designed, um, and I wanted to have some kind of handwriting logic where this ends, for example, um, are um, to, to join somehow correctly or more naturally, so that there's not that gap here. Um, and so I've made that skeleton, which is just a bunch of numbers or curves. And you see, if you write, the ends are connected somehow, and then it's quite easy to, to change the, the width or also to change the, uh, the width of the letters at some points, which is not perfect, but it, yeah, at some point the, the imperfectness also produces quite interesting uh, results. Or another example uh, that uh, was a project from students at in Switzerland at the Ecal Cantonal in Lausanne, also maybe 10 years old. And they also developed a, a skeleton for the letters, which is more like this one. And they made an editor, uh, editor um, where these lines could be replaced with other forms, of course, thicker lines, but also with curves. And you see some for the A, this, this curve and this curve is the same. So they, they said, okay, some um, shapes inside a font have the same, um, yeah, should be replaced with the same shape. And also not just replacing the, the different lines in the letters uh, was possible to, to change it. It's also, of course, you could change the skeleton. So make it thinner or uh, make the horizontal line thinner and the vertical thicker or the other way around or altogether bolder or lighter. And this was the interesting thing and, uh, at this project is they made one result, which was this more or less normal um, font. And they um, used rapid prototyping to cut wood letters out of that font. So they got back from the digital world in, into the, the, the haptical, the, the physical world and um, made these letter to to print posters with that one but so these were results for just some musical events they evented or maybe i don't know if they really happened there in june 2008 um or so so and they combined the that wood cut letters this the red ones here with other fonts they made with the more experimental font uh, they made with their program. So I think that's a very interesting, nice twist in that project um, to, to use these generated letters. Okay, so what we're doing in this workshop is more or less in that in that realm. So we maybe manipulate existing or 
doing something with a letter skeleton. I can I'll explain to you what what it's mean, meant, and then manipulate that. But in typography, there's not just letters; it's also layout. And of course, we could apply um, also generative principles or generative design principles to layout. One principle or layout uh, stuff that you maybe already know more or less conscious, consciously um, is in responsive web design. So there are lots of websites that are made like this. They're working okay in the browser, but they should also work in browsers that are not exactly your size or on mobile phones. So that's the point where React responsive web design comes in. So the layout is adjusted to the width of the of the browser window. And of course should still work and should look nice. And you wouldn't call that generative web design, but in fact it's some kind of programming or, or rules uh, that will lead to that result. So it, in fact, it's kind of generative. Or another, that's that's some kind of experiment I just did. It's it's not really uh, great, but um, for example, in InDesign, you can use scripts to to program the content uh, or to to make uh, the content of InDesign. I used Basil JS. It's a um, a library, in fact, also made from uh, or in, in collaboration with Ted Davis. Um, we heard that name. He's doing the other workshop, Life Coding. Um, and yeah, so, uh, but it's also, it's just a port from maybe processing to InDesign, making it easier to do some coding there. And I just tried, okay, I took some text and I wanted to generate layouts. Um, and these are just different layouts, uh, but I wanted to to have the, to be the text still in somehow the right order. But you see, it's not so easy to program nice layouts. Or another little experiment, um, which also is trying to um, to do something with layout, is on my website. I made a little. Um, I did this, uh, did this little project, and not much to explain, probably. So it's just rotating all the elements on a website more or less according to the to this maximum angle and uh, applying this also to to all the the other sides on that subsites of of that uh, web page or another example um, A bit more applied typographic and layout, a bit more applied to data graphics. Oh, I didn't translate that, okay. <laughs> data visualization. Um, these were texts from Shakespeare's uh, dramas, which he um, transformed to some typographic uh, data visualizations. But interesting thing is he did a little animation of all the steps he had while programming different visualizations. And that's a very great example of how you can see how changing parameters uh, is a extremely important um, thing in dealing with generative design. Yeah, 
it goes on a little bit more, I think. Yeah, still <laughs> running. Okay. So another maybe interesting stuff about generative design is, of course, we can use these programming stuff to produce a single artwork or variate single artworks a little bit easier. But um, one great thing about being able to use programming is that you possibly can make your own tools. So um, an example, if you, for example, uh, need to uh, translate this kind of uh, letters, which is just pixels, for example, to something like this, where you replace um, every pixel with a special module uh, according to the uh, pixels beside. So if they're left on the right, if there is a pixel set, then there should be a horizontal line. Or if there is one on the left and one downwards, it should be a curve like this. And <clears throat> if you want to do this uh, once, it's okay to do it in, um, in Illustrator or so, but if you do this lots of lots of times, it might be easier to program some kind of tool where you just can set these pixels and the algorithm is doing the replacement with the modules, here are different modules. So, um, and you can, if you, you can use it, but maybe if you're a bit more advanced, you can also have more editing functions. So you can just set pixels, you can remove them or replacing some modules with other modules and so on. So this is already your own kind of specialized, let's call it specialized illustrator. Or another nice project, also some years old, probably also 10 years old, um, done with a scripting tool for Illustrator, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, it was a lettering tool from Jonathan Pukki. Um, where he programmed some skeletons for special letters, but these could be manipulated quite easily in very specialized ways. And you could use it like this. And this was is all already some kind of, of tool. And uh, somebody else, Luna Mauro, used that for doing uh, some pages of her, um, I, I don't know, I think it was, it was also uh, final work on, on her studies, I don't know. But um, so one designer, Jonathan Pukki, could be the, the maker of a tool for another one, for yourself or for, for someone else. So that's very cool to, to be um, to be able to make your own tools. You're still with me. I can't see you. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so that was, um, of course, specialized to the to the field of typography, lots or some examples and ways what you can do with it. And I want to show you some more projects just to give you a bit of a pro broader um, yeah, view on, on um, generative design. And because generative design is not not really practical for everything what we're doing, but it could be applied to many fields of um, um, of design or art. And um, 
maybe something um, that you in, in that or another way you already know uh, is in, in every kind of um, corporate design stuff or advertising when there is some kind of animation um, or translating stuff to to lots of lot of of um, little forms and lines and triangles and stuff because of course that that person they they probably tracked uh, that person with um, with a camera and then some more or less complicated algorithms oh, I just have to make it um, produced all that triangles and colors and stuff and so on <clears throat> so this wouldn't be possible without lots of lots of code to do it and um, so that was advertising also kind of artistic approach um, a completely different example I just uh, have wanted to show you that that it's um, a really different way of using generative techniques is that's an art installation um, with some kind of uh, no it's not really a, a plotter or something but uh, a machine which can just take all these stones and move it to another place on that plane and so they they program some desired results so having 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 them all unordered or ordered to, to specific colors and sizes and so on or other stuff and uh, so the machine just took these stones and put them to another location, which is very, of course, very slow probably, but as an art installation, it uh, has a very cool kind of, I think, aesthetic also, but um, also that kind of generative technique applied to that, that uh, realm is quite interesting. A bit more down to earth um, is this kind of using generative techniques, which is data visualization. And that's, of course, in, in many cases, kind of useful um, stuff, which is also not really possible to do by hand, because as you can see, this is, I, I'm not, sh not sure, probably, can, you, can we see this somewhere? Tokyo? No. Uh, but does anybody know what it could be? But I think may, maybe it's Tokyo and population in Tokyo and so on. And it would also be almost impossible to put all those little um, um, cubes and, and bars on a, on a 3D plane. Uh, so somebody probably would have to program it to, to put all that stuff on the screen. Ah, yeah, sounds very Japanese. So, ah, Osaka, seems to be Osaka, okay. Um, <clears throat> or another kind of data visualization. Um, it's a project from a colleague of mine. They visualized uh, in this case, case, Road to Rome, which is, uh, they made an algorithm um, asking Google Maps, which is the shortest way to Rome or the, the, the fastest way to Rome from every point in Europe. And this results in, in, a, in something like this. Of course, you could apply this also, not just to, to Rome, but also to Paris or Berlin or to all the capital cities. Um, uh, 
think. Okay, of course, if this is Berlin, it's faster from many parts of Poland to get to Berlin then, for example, I'm probably somewhere, oh, don't know, maybe somewhere here. And so Luxembourg, must, that should be Luxembourg, would be the fastest, the, the near, the closest capital city. Okay, some more projects. This is again something very different. Uh, that's um, Bjork, the, the musician, um, and for some kind of uh, stage show, she, uh, this group and people, they developed some kind of uh, way of making strange masks. Uh, so having a face and then having some strange algorithms producing uh, some fiber structures or muscular structures looking a bit strange and creepy, but of course uh, it's also lots of algorithmic uh, stuff happening here. So it's generative design, in fact. Um, and these were some results and probably, as, as we could see here, made, came, come to real and just prototyped with, uh, yeah, rapid prototyping or 3D printers and stuff. Or this somehow similar uh, a project uh, where they try to make different kind of ch chairs, or it doesn't have to be chairs, but in that uh, case it was, uh, made from modular elements, and they built an editor where they could do it. I didn't completely understand what's happening there, but in fact they produced some of these chairs, or at least one, called voxel chair and um, and again as I said before it's um, one main part of that project was probably to make that tool to make some kind of tool which made the production and design for this kind of chairs possible so a very specialized yeah, 3D development tool they built. Yeah, maybe just go a bit further. But somehow strange how it works. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. So, seems to work somehow. Or also with some kind of wrapped prototyping, but an Another tool somebody made um, for um, for textiles, just for clothes, to design generative patterns and bring them to real again. There's also some kind of documentation. Maybe let's have a look. share and write thousands of stories within the digital world where there is a lack of physical expression. But what if you could use your emotions to interact with the stories and create a whole new language?
collaboration with an interaction designer, textile designer, and a fashion designer, we created a unique web shop that allows you to experience and create an abstract of your own. When entering the web shop, simply allow the website to use your webcam to track certain points. algorithm now reads your facial expression, and by combining this with the rhythm of the keyboard and the content of the story, we transform this data into a visual representation of your abstract. Choose between different styles, color combinations, and your size. Customize the position and scale of your pattern. We believe you keep and care more about your apparel when you feel connected with it. Make an abstract and share the stories you love. Which story would you tell? Okay. <clears throat> so you, you see generative principles could be applied to many, many fields. And another example, I maybe I go a bit faster uh, through that because that's uh, also very cool project, I think, uh, applied to photography. So it's uh, architecture photo photography um, and they made a tool to, to split photographs of buildings to segments and labeling them somehow um, and their algorithm now produced images trying to um, but trying to keep some kind of perspective so it's not just a collage where um, things are put randomly on the screen they're put somewhere to to keep somehow uh, somehow of the perspective impression and these were some results some of them looking almost like real photography of course strange and complicated but um, there are also some kind some results like this or this. So these are all uh, very, very different, of course, not, not so easy to, to program projects, but that's the, um, the place where all this, where, where this principle could lead and applied to. At, for the end for this presentation, I have one more little project, which is not so much really generative design, um, it's this one, it's, you wouldn't call this really generative, but it's also, it's programmed, it's, it's maybe a kind of an interface, <laughs> but, uh, or physical computing um, stuff, but, but also it's, it's a set of rules which uh, is doing something. So, in fact, it's a bit, you know, kind of generative design. Maybe I just show you what's, what he's done. 